Meredith Copet Levian, President and CEO of the New York Times, is one of my dear friends who I love deeply. Uh, she leads the company's global operations and directs its business strategy. She joined the Times nearly a decade ago to run advertising uh, and became CEO in 2020. Interviewing her, chatting with her is Logan Bartlett, the managing director of Redpoint Ventures. Logan is also a host of Cartoon Avatars, a podcast covering the biggest stories in tech, but a side that nobody talks about. Let's give them a big round of applause, guys. Let's bring some energy for the end of the day. Thank you. All right. Meredith, we have to, I think I counted Zach said fuck seven times, so we're gonna need to one up that. Uh, ah. Thank you for doing this. You're welcome, I'm happy to be here. You so, know what today is? No, what is today? Well, we Thursday? We figured this out, uh, team members here, we figured this out like half an hour ago on the way here. It's my two year anniversary of being CEO of the Times. Congratulations. Fun day to be here. And you've been at the Times for how long? Nine years wow. and counting, yeah. So, so you are the CEO of the New York Times, which is distinct, I guess, as a disclosure from the editor of the New York Times. Maybe just to level set everyone, what the distinction between the two, what rolls into you functionally, how that sort of gets. Yeah, yeah. I have a lot more fun. Yeah, I believe it. Um, no, so um, it's, a, it's a good question. The first thing I always tell people is if you have something to say, um, about the way you or your firm is covered in the Times. Don't bother telling me, because I have no Going or do. over it, so that, that's- Well, you'll be giving your email out yeah, after. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, the executive editor of the Times responsible for our journalism, his job is to make sure that we have a world-class news report. My job is to make sure we have a successful business. We both actually report to the chairman and publisher of the Times, he's part of the, the Ox Sulzberger family, and I'll just say that the structure, CEO not responsible for the, the content, not responsible for the coverage, is meant, it's been in place for a very long time, and it's meant to protect the independence of the journalism. So it's, you know, the idea is the journalism should be free from any influence, um, including our own commercial interest and you know it's it's the only the its purpose is is to pursue the truth so my kpi is are we running a great and highly successful business and do we have the right growth strategy and are we building a larger and more profitable company as we go and his kpi is are we doing the best journalism in the world if i get my kpi right he's getting his kpi or and is he's he's able to do his more easily and so the, the functional roles that will report into him are journalists, yeah. reporters? Basically the coverage. And coverage. that's about news coverage. Um, our news operation reports into him. Um, I, I'm responsible for all of our monetization, so all the commercial functions, our ad business, um, obviously our subscription business, marketing. I'm responsible for um, how people find and experience our journalism. So all things tech, data, digital product development. We have a giant yep. digital product development team. Um, I look after our standalone products. So I was saying to you just a few minutes ago, um, we, we've got a, a terrific um, portfolio of games and you may have heard we acquired a game called Wordle earlier this year. So that that's in, in my remit. Um, so Wordle is just one of the great games we have. Um, and I'm also responsible, we, we acquired a company called The Athletic, which is the second largest sports journalism subscription business um, in, in America. It's the largest, to my knowledge, without, without sports rights. I'm, I'm in charge of that. And basically the, the complex of products that sit around our, our news product. And then lastly, I'll just say, because I think for any company leader today, the, the, there are really interesting questions here. You know, I'm in charge of all the kind of how we show up and roll as a company. Um, so HR, finance, legal, comms, can't have enough comms people today. Yeah, totally. Um, so that's-, that's so, so, in term, so the New York Times gone through a big transformation from uh, offline to online and- Still have a newspaper. Still have a newspaper. Yes. Uh, heavier percentage ad based to heavier percentage yeah. subscription based. Um, you were there throughout this majority of the, how, how does actually a shift like that 
happen? Uh, it clearly was an existential risk if you didn't do it. So how do you go about tactically making something like that happen? Yeah, that's a, that's a fun question. And I should say, um, so I've been there nine years and I've spent like the vast majority of that time working on the, on the challenge of how do you go from being print-based, ad-heavy business with much of the profit coming you from- you came up in ads as well. I, came, I came up in ads, yep. Um, and a, a shrinking print-based, ad-based business to, to a growing digital-based, subscription-based um, business. Um, it's been, been a lot of fun. Um, I'll, I'll say a couple things. Um, when I joined the company in 2013, we had sort of survived, like the, you, you asked about existential crisis. We had kind of made it through like the existential crisis Would the times be around if there, you know, if there was Google and, and other companies, but we were sort of running in place as a business. And as we looked ahead, you know, our print business was shrinking. We had a digital advertising business that was growing, but you know, in 2013, you're just beginning to see the big tech platforms emerge. And so the writing was kind of on the wall for those growth prospects. And we had, we had a digital subscription business that was kind of nascent and new at that point, but we weren't growing our digital business anywhere enough to make up for what we thought would be very steep print declines to, to come. Um, and so we really needed, you know, like, there needs to be a galvanizing reason for transformation. And we just had this idea that we would not be able to do our journalism as ambitiously um, as we had done in, you know, in, in for at that point, 160 some odd years. And we, we didn't, we saw the writing on the wall that we'd shrink as a company. And so the, you asked, how did we do it? Yeah. You know, we got people together at, at the top of the company, news and business. Um, you know, a, a small group of us, less than 10, um, in, you know, like 2015. And we said, what are the big calls we have to make about our future? And we made a handful of big calls that like still characterize the business today. The first one was very simply, what's our business? What are we, we doing here? And I always say the business strategy of the New York Times is five words. We make journalism worth paying for. And that was just like naming that, um, you know, that, that's a very simple idea in, in, you know, 2015 that was still worth paying for against a backdrop of a lot of free alternatives. But that meant like the resources go first and most to the journalism. So that was the first thing we said. Um, we said we're a subscription business first. In 20, you know, that seems kind of like a duh now. In 2015, that was a really big call. It meant like first, we do everything first at the company. Was that in contrast? Consumers. Is that digital an subscription? Ad uh, versus ads. Ver versus ads. And I'll say we have long had a pretty big and stable print subscription business. There are lots and lots of people, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of people who pay a lot for the New York Times in print. But we saw the need to grow the company was to really scale digital subscriptions. And we said, that's the main idea of the company. And that means we don't make things for advertisers. We, we only do things for consumers because we believe this is like gonna be journalism worth paying for. And by the way, in the end, we made the bet that would mean a better ad business. And in fact, it, it has meant that. We also, I'll, I'll tell you one more. We said, you know, and this was controversial in 2015, we're a destination. We want to be a news site that, you know, people call by name, ask for by name, build a direct relationship with. At the time, most of the digitally native media companies were sort of, you know, writing and editing for Facebook and for, for, for the platforms. And we said, that's not our game. We need the platforms to help bring people to the platform. But ultimately, our best stuff should be on our own platforms. So those are uh, unifying mission statements of what you believe. What point in the future did you pick to like actually march towards something? Obviously, you needed to actionize that. Like how, so, so that happens, and you have these big, broad, visionary statements. Yeah. And you say, hey, in three years, we're going to get to X, Y, Z? Great question. I have two answers to that. At that moment in time, in 2015, we said the mile marker is we're gonna do these things and we're gonna double our digital revenue by 2020. So we, we said over the next, you know, it was like five and a half years. 
right? By the way, we got there more than a year early. Um, and it was so clear we were going to get there early. We said, um, it, it, I think beginning of 2019, we set another mile marker. We said, we're going to get to 10 million subscriptions, um, total subscriptions, mostly digital, by 2025. We got there much earlier. Yep. So we, we've actually just set another target. We said 15 million subscribers. It's harder to get a subscriber than a subscription because people buy multiple things from you by 2027. So basically five years, six years, that's, that's how we're kind of planning. But, but I want to make a, a slightly different point. Um, the Times has been around for 170 plus years. We really think in like decade and generational time horizons. And we have ambitions for, you know, what's the New York Times going to be? How much bigger and more ambitious and more impactful can the journalism be? How much bigger business can we be over the next 10 years, 20 years? And one of the great things about the New York Times is we're a family controlled public company. That control structure allows us to be very focused on what's the value, cre the really big value creating thing to do for the long, long term. And I think that's why the a big part of why the Times is where it is today versus a lot of the rest of, of um, digital media companies. What, what was the hardest part about that? Like actually making this happen in practice? All this sounds obvious in hindsight, like seems like, okay. And at the time it clearly wasn't. People were building for Facebook or thought that ads were going to rule the world in perpetuity. So what was the hardest part about making it actually happen? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple things. Um, we were really choiceful. You asked me, was it um, digital versus print? Yep. I said, actually, it was really subscription. It was that, but the more profound things thing was subscriptions over advertising. We made hard calls, and that meant we're not going to put time and resources or as, as much um, of our time and energy into those things. And to get, you know, thousands of people sort of marching in that direction. Not everybody likes those calls, but ultimately the key to really changing something is to say, we've got a vision for this thing over a long time horizon, and we at the top of the house are gonna get aligned on the very tough calls to get there. I'll give you one more. Another thing that I think has helped the Times get to where it is, is the first dollar in the place goes to the journalism. Period, hard stop. And that is in good times, and that's even in, in dark economic times. And, you know, that means there are moments when, you know, you want to be growing faster from, you know, uh, um, one perspective. But you say if you actually ensure that you're investing in your product the whole way through, you're ultimately creating more value over a longer time horizon. You touched on product there, and I think most people, New York Times is a media company does journalism reporting but you've you've built as well you have a lot of engineers working for you a lot of product people yeah. designers all that you've actually product led is uh, a big term now in technology in general and i i think there's a lot of stuff you guys do to be product led be it the soft soft gating of paywalls yeah. and wordle top of funnel and yep. um, podcasts and all that how do you think about uh what it is to be product led and what the funnel of a, a New York Times uh, paying customer looks like. Yeah, I love this question because it's Thank like you. the zone that I've spent so much of the last um, half dozen years in. I, I joke inside that I like ran for office in my prior job at the Times as COO on a platform of product-driven growth. So it's like not a new idea at the Times. And, and here's why today, you know, something like 50 to 100 million people come to the New York Times every week. Nine million people, a little more than nine million people pay us for a subscription. So we, are, we already have this giant audience funnel right in front of us. And, you know, the idea is um, the vast majority of our growth comes by the experience someone has as, you know, often a non-paying customer, the experience they have when they hit a story page of the New York Times or when they get to the home page or when they open an email um, from us. I would say, um, you know, we also 
put a lot of investment into brand at the New York Times and we, you know, spend real money in marketing and we, we've got a, a very sophisticated marketing team, but the vast majority of our growth comes from the way we sort of manage the free experience um, and the paid experience. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll say two things. Um, one, the Times has, you know, over the last like decade, um, with a, I think the pay model now for the New York Times digital subscriptions are probably 11 or 12 years old now. Um, even going back to when we launched, we've always had a pretty porous paywall, meaning you can get a lot of stuff for free. And that, had, that serves two purposes. One, it serves the mission purpose. We want a really wide audience for our journalism. We think that's really important. It's important to society. But two, it also means we're really building a funnel um, for where is where's the next subscriber gonna come from. So we are incredibly focused on both making sure there's enough value in the subscribed state so that you pay, but also so that we're constantly bringing new people into the times. So one way that you do that, I think, is through the daily, which has been, I, I don't know, number one, two. Through the daily? The daily yeah. podcast, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. As a, as a podcaster in good standing, you actually have to talk about other podcasts. Uh, and so you particularly have to talk about the daily. I, I, have, to, I have to do it, um, which has been an amazing success. It's been going it's on for how long? Success. So it's probably six years old. Um, and was a personal project, I, I think you uh, took an interest I, I in wanna, it early I on. actually want to credit, um, we have an extraordinary um, team of people who, in, who, who are still um, working in our audio operation. Um, a, a guy named Sam Dolnick, who's a very senior editor, and a woman named Lisa Tobin, who was the original like mother and leader um, of The Daily, and Michael Barbaro, its host. They were there in inception. And they get all the credit for making something really extraordinary. There was actually a really fun anecdote um, at the Times that when, when they brought one of them, I don't know which, brought like an early cut of the daily to somebody on the leadership team, that person said, but wait, it's only one story. We're the New York Times. We, like, we have to tell multiple stories. And it was this like great manifestation of like the what you do in the next medium has to be of your quality and it has to be of what you have brand permission to do, but it's also gonna be very, very different from what you did in your last medium. And the daily, unlike the newspaper, is one big story a day. So, um, so it was started six years ago. What's remarkable about it is a couple million people um, probably listen to the daily, something in that range every single day. More people listen to the daily every day still six years in than ever read the weekday newspaper, um, huge audience. It's also brought a really different audience to the time, the demographic of who listens to the daily is younger, it's more female, um, just been a huge success. And one of the things that it's done that I don't think gets enough attention is it's explained um, to many um, times listeners how a story comes to be so, you know, a lot of times we'll publish a big story and the next day, the reporters on that story or the editor will be on the daily kind of telling you, um, how did this happen? I mean, the, the kind of shiny example is Jody Cantor and Megan Tuhi on the daily just after the Harvey Weinstein story and investigation broke. Um, and they were able to tell how they actually got to this story that was part of a body of work that like literally changed the world. So the daily gives people a chance to not just know the story, but to know how did this story come to be? What went into it? And I actually think that's done a lot for journalism to remind people what goes into independent journalism. And so it's been an amazing success. I think it's top, I don't know, I always see it top one, two, three, four, five uh, on the podcast list I look at. Consistently. Consistently. I'm really proud of. Consistently. Yeah. What, um, I, I don't know what the next podcast is for the New York, Ezra Klein maybe has the Ezra next. Ezra Klein show, everyone should listen. Yeah. But Incredible. He, he came over to the New York Times. Into the Times. So I, I don't know what the next homegrown podcast is, but breaking through, as I've seen myself, breaking through in the podcast ecosystem hard. is hard. What do you think? The Daily caught lightning in the bottle with, and what do you think uh, other podcasts uh, maybe haven't had the same level 
of breakthrough noise? Because you guys have invested quite a bit in podcasts. What do you think makes it a uniquely difficult platform that The Daily did well and that you're trying to recapture? That's a great question. Uh, I'll say a couple of things. One, the amount of kind of time and energy and resource that goes into The Daily is staggering. So like every bit of it, you know, the number of, um, of producers who work on it, the people making, you know, the people making the sound in the can background. You, can you say the, the, how many people? It's, it's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Um, but, but by the way, it's worth it. It's a wild success from a consumer standpoint. It is very, um, it is a very successful advertising vehicle. So, so one of the things, and I, I just feel like this doesn't get talked about enough, it is a highly produced endeavor. Um, and, and like the care and the creative energy that goes into making the New York Times goes into the daily. And so that, that's a piece of it. The other piece of it that I feel like people don't talk about that makes the daily magical is it's got a newsroom of a couple thousand people at the New York Times making journalism for its topics. So, you know, something extraordinary happens in the world. And that night they've got, you know, often like the reporters who are at the scene and in, you know, in the widest way with the most resources there to tell you about it. And the incredible example of that, we named, um, we named a second host um, of The Daily this year, and she happens to be, um, she speaks Russian. And when Russia invaded Ukraine, we actually, you know, they, they um, ran The Daily from Ukraine. And there are these incredible episodes where she is like literally reporting on the daily. So it's really the thing that makes it so magical is it's got the whole of, of the New York They get to cherry pick uh, yeah. the, the best of it. Yeah, but, and I, I'll just say, because it's like, it is magical. The Ezra Klein show is really, really good. And I'll also say like, you talk to Ezra, the kind of level of care and research and kind of background work. One of the things that differentiates a New York Times story from, you know, other stories potentially on the same topic is the level of care and attention and resources that go into it. And I think Ezra would say, I, I suspect he would say the level of care and kind of creative energy that's gone into his show is awesome. That's great. Um, you mentioned brand and investing yeah. a lot in brand. Uh, the New York Times obviously has an iconic brand and we're living in, uh, I would say, polarized times in the media at large. And I realize you're not responsible for editorial and all of that. I, I could argue that some level of the polarization actually uh, is, is good for business, right? Uh, and there's elements of, of some, um, are you actually a, uh, a liberal in good standing if you're not subscribed to the New York Times, right? Or you don't listen to the Daily or all of that. How, what do you think just at New York Times brand level and, and everything that's going on in the media uh, world today, like you have to manage this. You're not obviously weighing in on the reporters, but it impacts the business side of it. It's been an interesting two years. It's been an interesting, did you say nine since you've been there? What, what, We've all been interesting. Yeah, I, I don't know that. For one reason or another. Yeah. Any, any just, uh, I'll leave it open-ended, but just any thoughts yeah. or I feel like I, I have to ask that question. Yeah. Um, I can't tell if you're like poking at a premise, is polarization good for business? I, I want to be- Not really, poking, explicit, I, I will ask that. Yeah. Is, is it good for business? Uh, and, and, uh, and I guess, how do you think, how do you view all this? I want to be really clear about two things. One, we are doing independent journalism that, as I said earlier, is, you know, its objective is to help people seek the truth and with curiosity and open-mindedness, understand the world. That is the work of the times, one. So we are not writing for any one group or another. We are, this is about the pursuit of truth. And the other thing I wanna say is, um, and this is where the mission and the business, there's like no daylight for it to work. You know, really high quality general interest news should have a really wide audience. And we are incredibly focused on the relevance of our journalism to a very large group of people. 
Um, you know, anecdotally, I'll say I was, I, I, I can't remember if I was chief revenue officer or chief operating officer, but I was in charge of subscriptions just after Trump was elected. And there was this like huge surge, you know, in late 2016. And then of course, you know, that comes down off a peak like a year later and everybody was like, oh, they're never gonna sell more subscriptions. And of course we did, we, we kept growing. And then Biden was elected and everybody said, oh, they're never gonna sell more subscriptions. And of course we did, we actually had a better year. We sold more subscriptions, net subscriptions in 2021 than we had in 2019. Nineteen. Um, so, you know, like we live in a really complex world. We want to be seeking the truth and helping a much wider group of people get to understanding um, in that world. And we, we think our products are going to be increasingly valuable to, to a wide group. I'm going to say one more thing on your polarized point. At the peak of COVID, one in two adult Americans were coming to the New York Times. So, you know, like that is not journalism for, for like a group of people. And, and, you know, some number of months ago, just our COVID case tracking database crossed a billion views. Oh. So it's like, you know, this is journalism for a really wide audience. It's, so obviously the, the structure of the times allows uh, the, the governing body to sort of pick a time decades in the future, right? Uh, and then there's, there's zooming that all the way into what, what does someone do tomorrow? Yeah. As you think about these like ebbs and flows of it, what point do you pick to manage against? It sounds like 2026, you set some goals or 2027, you reset goals around. Yeah. Um, well, let me, let me just comment on what we're doing now. So I told you, we said we doubled div digital revenue. We got there faster. And then we said 10 million subscriptions. We got there faster. The new target is 15 million subscribers by, by year end. 2027 and to build a larger and more profitable company as we go. Um, and how do we do that? We, our vision is we want to be the essential subscription for everyone in the English speaking world who wants to engage deeply with the world and understand it. And that means doing three things really, really well, be the world's best news destination. I think we've got a running start at that, but still plenty more to do. Two, help people engage more deeply with their lives and their passions with leading lifestyle products. You know, we've got an unbelievable recipe app. We have a really cool portfolio of games and a crazy successful game in Wordle that's just pointing attention to all these other awesome games we have. We just bought The Athletic. We intend to go really big in sports and, and we've got a great shopping advice site. So lead in news, build leadership in these other spaces and then put those two things together in a way that makes the New York Times in all of its kind of breadth indispensable to the daily lives of tens of millions more people. That is the game we're playing. And by the way, that is, you know, the better we do at that, the more highly ambitious journalism that holds power to account we can do and the larger and more profitable company we build. That's great. Uh, well, we're coming up on time. Can I give you some quick hitters real fast? Just yeah. You. Substack. Uh-huh. <laughs> quick hit response, immediate thing that comes to mind. More journalism for more people is always a good thing. Twitter. <sighs> um, we are really focused on Twitter has a place. We are incredible incredibly focused on making sure um, we don't overuse Twitter to hear one particular audience or another. Fake news. I hate that expression. And I think it's done such a disservice to the public's understanding of the value and the resources that go into real, you know, quality, original, independent journalism. New York City. Awesome. So happy to be here. <laughs> Donald Trump. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Meredith Kofit Levian. Give me thank, one more. Yeah. Return. Wait, wait, wait. Return to the office. So I've been CEO for two years today with, without the full New York Times kind of in a hybrid way with many people coming to an office many days. And I am really excited next week we begin our official hybrid, you know, majority of people there. Um, you know, a couple or a few days a week. And I am so excited about that. Awesome. Well, thank you for doing this. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Alexa.